Our lesson this morning is from Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This ends our reading. Let us bow in prayer. Gracious God, we come this day because we believe. We believe you have called us, called us to faith, called us to worship, called us to service. Encourage us, Lord, with your word. And use this message now to and for your glory alone. In Christ's name we would pray. Amen. Grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Of what are you convinced? Are you convinced the economy will get worse, get better, or stay the same? Are you convinced that the effects of COVID-19 on our country will continue? Are you convinced that the twins will win the pennant with this new shorter season? The definition of the word convinced means to stand firm in what you are saying, in what you believe or say to be true. This morning, I'd like to share with you some of my convictions of which I am convinced are true. First, I am convinced that God claims us. I know that often it is suggested that it is we who find God, but I am convinced that God has not only created us, but it is God who finds us and redeems us, or as it is written in the book of Ephesians, but God who is rich in mercy out of great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. This is God's doing. It begins with God. Second, I am convinced that we are created for relationships. The difficulty is we're not always good at relationships, both with others and even with ourselves. I love the story from Genesis 3, where after God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, God tells them that they may eat freely from every tree in the garden except one. <laughs> and like a child, they focus on that which they have been told not to touch. Why is it that the very thing you are often asked not to do is the very thing we wind up doing? Eve, being tempted, sees the forbidden fruit, that it looked good, and does that very thing that risks everything with God, and Adam follows along. However, what I find revealing and tender is what happens next. 
God comes walking in the garden, garden in the evening and calls for his children. And he says, where are you? <laughs> and I like this. They answer, we're hiding because we are afraid. I love the response. Doesn't it sound like a child responding to a parent? They think that they can't be seen, but the parent not only sees them, but knows them. God knows what they have done, and out of love comes looking for them. God doesn't come to destroy them. God doesn't come filled with rage or anger. And in the midst of the reality of their lives, in the midst of being caught doing exactly what God had asked them not to do, God cares for them, nurtures them. And if you notice, even though they go out of the garden, away from the protection, God makes clothes for them to protect them and cover them. Oh, there's a cost for disobedience. But that cost doesn't prevent a parent's love. It doesn't prevent God's love and caring for them. Third, I am convinced that faith is a gift. A gift from God. A gift that is also encouraged by others who share this gift of faith. Faith and the values that come with faith are to be encouraged. In Hebrews 3.13 it reads, the community of faith is called to encourage one another daily. Fourth, I am convinced that if you want peace and hope and joy and love and contentment and understanding, you need to let go of that which does not make for peace and hope and joy and love and contentment and understanding, such as doubt and fear and anger and judgment and condemnation. It is clear you can't have both. Instead, you must let go of one to have the other. Fifth, I am convinced that the front door of the church is not the doors that lead into the building. Instead, the doors that lead in and out of our homes in our daily lives are the front door of the church. For the gift of faith is nurtured and encouraged through trusted, caring, faithful relationships that more often than not are rooted in and around our homes and in community and in daily life with parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbors and mentors and teachers and trusted friends and colleagues. The reason I have chosen to focus on this word conviction is in response to our Bible reading for today in Romans 8 where Paul declares that he is convinced convinced that nothing but nothing can separate us from the love of God. Did you hear that? The Apostle Paul is convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is convinced that God loves sinners, that God loves even Paul, the same Paul who, who persecuted the early believers, who called himself the chief of all sinners, who was there that day before his conversion when, when Stephen was the first Christian martyr and stoned to death. Paul, who before his coming to faith, he did not know that God and that love and that peace, that unmerited love that changed his life. Or as we read, God is love in 1 John. A few years ago, I came across a true story, a story about a, uh, the love of a young brother uh, for his even older sister. This little sister was suffering from a rare blood disease, a, a disease that the brother had recovered from only two years earlier. The doctors believed that a blood transfusion from someone who had developed the antibodies necessary to fight this disease could offer his sister the best hope. And since the brother had the same blood type, he was the ideal choice. Her brother was indeed brave. And because the doctors came and explained how his blood could save his little sister, I think I called him the littler brother, but he was the older brother, and then asked if they could use his blood to save her life. And as his little lip was quivering, the doctor said, he looked up and said, for my little sister, sure. 
With the doctors watching, the nurse came and inserted the needle into the boy's arm. The little boy watched with a very serious face as the blood flowed out of his arm and through the tube, and then amidst the silence, the little boy asked with a quiet and shaky voice, he said, Doctor, when do I die? It was only then that the doctors realized that the little boy was hesitant, why his lips were trembling when he was asked to give his blood for his little sister. He thought that she needed it all. He thought that in order for his sister to live, he would have to die. And out of love, he was willing to give it all. God so loved the world, so loved what he had created, so loved that he gave of himself, gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what Jesus declares in John 3, 16. And it continues in verse 17, just following it, where he says, For God did not send his son into the world. This is Jesus speaking. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus declares God's conviction that nothing but nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love. In the midst of all our convictions, in the midst of all that we believe to be true, remember God's conviction, God's promise to us that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are his. And in response, we are called to trust his promise and to allow it to give us life and to share it with others. So come. Come and hear the good news, the good news of God's conviction, God's love, God's forgiveness. Come and know that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The good news is that because of his love for us in Christ, that nothing but nothing can ever separate us from his love, his mercy, his grace, his presence, his promises. So come, come and hear, then go and live Go and serve. Go in peace. Amen. Now that may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.